All right, everybody, we are in the home stretch. And guess what? You get to listen to me for the next uh, 40 minutes. I hope you will hang. Um, I'm trying to find the share button momentarily. Let me do that because I'm not good at multi uh, processing. There we go. Hold on. It's kind of hard when you're the facilitator and you're also the presenter. Okay, so I'm assuming that y'all can see it now. We are going to go. So um, in thinking about fun facts, right? I've been trying to think of an interesting fun fact every week. There's lots. I have a lot of grandkids. I have a couple of great grandkids. But something I remember from my early days, I've been passionate about technology my entire uh, career. And one of my early jobs, I worked, I had the pleasure of working at NASA Ames Research Center for 11 years. I started in a vision research lab. And then I have a short stint where I worked for a scientist who was studying how to, back then it was called flying by the nap of the earth, which today is, you know, heads up visual displays. And so one of my jobs was to write the, you know, they had flight trainers, flight simulators where they were training the pilots. And my job was to actually write a control simulator, get this, don't laugh or do laugh loudly on a Commodore 64. Like we are talking like 19, late 1980s, way before a lot of you folks were born. But it was super cool. Actually, the most coolest thing about that job is I got to fly the flight simulator at NASA Ames. It was like a 747. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, honestly, but he was in there with me, but it was pretty cool. I actually managed to get it back down on the runway without crashing the flight simulator. And he took me in the flight simulator because I had to like learn what I was going a program uh, for those scientists. And so I am fascinated by technology. I love technology. Uh, I've done many things in my cybersecurity career over the 30 plus years in cybersecurity. I've been in the technology industry for 40 years. And I'm excited about this presentation because it's about the future. I mean, this future is where you all are going to be working in the industry. You all are going to be solving some of these problems. And I'll be just relaxing on the beach with my adult beverage, watching my grandkids and my great grandkids, and some of you being the senior technologists in the industry. So we're going to look, we're going to peek into the future 2030. Uh, maybe uh, a little bit further, and I guess, let me get my other, I'm multi-processing now because I'm both, and I need to make sure that the, I have a, we have a whole production panel back here. So this is a dumb question, but hey, did you grow up connected? I would say like everybody, yes, because I have grandkids your age, I have, I have great grandkids um, and younger, and literally when they're two years old, they know how to navigate the iPhone. They know how to go out and pull down their favorite game. My, not that I like it. I have teenage grandkids now they are on TikTok. They've been on PlayStation 4. So we all grew up connected like I didn't. So here's another fun fact, right? The first computer I ever saw, saw we weren't allowed to touch was a TRS-80 uh, in Leland High School in 1980. So we didn't get to touch any electronics. So you grew up electronic. And so you know the power of having that information at your hand tips. But look, what, what are we gonna see in 2030? These are gonna be everyday things in this group right here. You're gonna be the group is, is gonna get to enjoy, that's gonna get to secure, that's gonna get to invent some of this technology. Like for example, we, we have automated driving vehicles, whatever you wanna call them today. We are gonna have like, Vehicles on demand. You won't even have to buy a car anymore. You can just use your iPhone. There'll be an application. You can say, I want to, I want the super Mercedes four-door limousine. I'm going to go up to San Francisco for the night. It pulls up to your door. You don't even have to be, you know, have a license now. You could probably be 16 and it crews you in the city, right? We're going to have, um, uh, deep fakes are going to be a reality. We have deep fakes today. There's completely artificially made up people uh, that have whole personalities and it's hard to tell the difference between the real picture and the deep fake picture. Earlier this week, people asked about like, what's gonna happen with quantum computing, right? So this is, you know, the size of a quantum computer. But in, in the 1980s, a Cray supercomputer was way bigger than that. And my little iPhone 
today, I'm going to show you my messages, has more computing power than that crazy supercomputer had, you know, 30 years ago. So quantum computers are going to get smaller, they're going to get more powerful, and perhaps you'll have one in your phone. Robots, someone talked about robots earlier, right? We have Siri, uh, we have all kinds of robotic agents. You see the little parking structure robots, you see the robots in the hospital that deliver the, the, the medication pills, um, you see drone robots. In the future, literally, we're gonna have our life-size robotic assistants. They're gonna have the knowledge of all the things that we do in our lives, our preferences, right? They're gonna help us make decisions, right? In the future, today, they're already doing cognitive um, research on cognitive implants. Think about the ability to do a cognitive implant that implants knowledge into your brain at a faster pace. Today, they're used for people that have um, Alzheimer's to help them with that. And then, you know, we're talking about, I accelerated the slide, right? The ability to have, you know, our iPhones, I mean, our phones are getting bigger. Sometimes they're getting smaller, but now we already have the capability where they fold. The screens are more pliable. And now we're gonna project the phone. We may even have something in, that we can implant into our skin and have mobile connectivity. So these are the things that you are gonna be in charge of securing, maybe designing and having to worry about. It won't be all that old static, older technology that the HP execs talked about. It's gonna be like blow your mind kinds of technology. And there's gonna be like James Line the third, who's gonna be like the super uber, the goat um, dude that's gonna help us secure all this technology back then. And so what does it look like some of the probable tech trends that we are going to see? And I'm gonna talk about each one of these real uh, briefly. I normally do this talk in an hour. I better watch the clock because I know y'all want to get out of here um, by 11. So let's just talk about that data, right? And, and, and I've been in IO, I was spent about six or seven years in the IOT space, fascinating space. Man, this is, this is a ripe space. If you love connected things, and we're going to talk a little bit more about connected things, this is a space that needs innovation. This is The, the threat landscape is tremendous. We, we need some of you Uber cybersecurity rock stars are going to help us secure our connected infrastructure in the future. Um, but all these things are bringing us more data, right? In 2020, there was approximately 44 zettabytes. How many zeros are there in a zettabyte? Anyone know offhand? I had to Google it this morning to remember. 21, that's a whole lot of zeros, right? A whole lot of zeros. They're saying in 2025, which is just a couple years away, there's gonna be 175. You know what? I bet it's gonna be more than that because in 2020, we, we didn't think there was gonna be 44. It was more. We're gonna have billions of things. Is it gonna be 75 billion? Is it gonna be 100 billion? Is it gonna be 150 billion? I don't think that we know. The digital interactions per person, can you, you know, today, all of you are having approximately 1,500 digital interactions today, probably more than that because we've been on this webinar, but can you imagine 5,000 digital interactions per day or even more, especially if I have my life-size robot that's um, helping me with all of my tasks. We're going constantly back and forth. Robots are going to be common. We're going to see the rise of the drones. They're going to be doing more and more of our technology. And automation is going to come into uh, maturity and fruition. Yeah, somebody said Skynet. I mean, look, like even five years ago, to think about what we can do with Skynet and actually having the, those kinds of internet speeds with the, um, uh, the, the Starlink, right? And, and a couple of months ago, when I was in New Mexico, I went there to see my grandson graduate from high school. We actually saw, we didn't know what it was at first. We thought it was aliens, but we actually saw a launch of the, the satellites. It kind of went up like a ladder. It was pretty cool. So we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of things and a lot of data, right? We're going to see that the connected day has already come to fruition. I want to take a couple minutes here and read something that I wrote and presented in 2020, uh, 2015 that did not exist in 2015. I said, you watch in a couple of years, this is going to be a reality. It is a reality now. So just listen, this was the connected day in 2015. It happens today. Imagine what it's going to look like in 2030 with automation, with AI, ML, with uh, robots, with 
pervasive connectivity and fabric that we're going to get with 5G, right? So this was 2015, right? During the night, you receive a gentle wake-up alert that your baby's diaper has reached maximum moisture capability. You head to the back, uh, you go change the diaper. You head back to bed and then later receive a wake-up alert from your smart smartwatch, fitness band, or alarm clock. Potentially, the traffic monitoring app sends an alert on the changing traffic patterns and adjusts the alarm clock to compensate to either wake you up earlier or later. You walk into the bathroom, turn on the lights, which triggers your coffee maker downstairs through a if then this that policy you created for your Wemo coffee maker. You're out the door on your morning drive and your daily advisor app alerts you to meeting adjustments and syncs with your mail filter app and you receive an alert that you have three high priority messages. Your text to voice app reads those messages while you drive. You pull into the parking lot and the parking space app lets you know there's a space on the first floor in the southwest corner in space 23. As you approach your building, the Cisco Smart Connected Security Monitoring System uses facial recognition to identify you. Your employment status is checked and access is provided. The voice system welcomes you to work. Your daily advisor app tells you that your 8 a.m. meeting has been moved to 12-2 Stevie Wonder, and the Smart Space app gives you the direction to the conference room. The lights go on as you walk in the room, the telepresence uh, system is activated, and your meeting magically stops. In the afternoon, your Smart Kid Tracker app lets you know your kids are now home from school and the, via the Wemo Bob. Your smart home security surveillance system is now activated. The doors are locked and the cameras are on. As you end your day, your smart traffic app alerts you to traffic changing patterns, optimal route home, and the best time to leave. On the way home, your smart pantry app let alters alerts you that you now are out of bread and milk, most likely due to your kids eating peanut butter and jelly and chocolate milk. Once you're home, your smart fitness app tells you that you still need 3,000 steps or 1.5 miles of activity and suggests options for completing. As you prepare dinner, your glucose monitoring contact lens sends an alert to your health monitoring app, advises of recommended food and protein intakes to balance. After dinner, you take a stroll with your husband to complete the remaining 3,000 steps. Once complete, your smart fitness app gives verbal praise, yay. As it nears bedtime, your daily advisor app alerts you to meeting time changes and automatically adjusts alarm clock and suggests times to retire. I wrote that in 2014, 2015, the connected day did not exist. It exists today. And imagine that as we move forward with the pace of automation and AIML. All right, Ron said about additive manufacturing. We are, we, and I'm sure some of you have 3D printers, right? We are moving into the realm where we're just gonna print what we need when we need it. And it's not gonna be some little fun toys that we print today. Do we need a new um, mirror for our car? Do we need a new part for the airplane? Do we need a new kidney? Do we need a new heart valve, right? There is biomedical research happening today to print what we need when we need it. So this is gonna be a huge, massive threat landscape that we are gonna need to secure. Not only the printers, and the network connectivity, but actually the materials that go into print, pr printing these things. Think about the supply chain demand, or if we can, or if a, if a threat actor is able to modify the materials that are used in the printer, they create structural insufficiencies in the material or slight modifications if we're printing a kidney or heart, what that would mean from a global perspective. All right, data lakes. What lakes is your data swimming in? Justin talked about Google, right? The data is pervasive with, um, and today it's even more and more challenging with global market access and data sovereignty laws and global privacy laws. But imagine the concept of context as a service, right? We're able to overcome the privacy challenges. Maybe we have everyday homo homomorphic encrypt, uh, encryption, that's hard to say. We have a way to do research and access the data without, uh, with allowing people to have access to the encrypted data without actually sharing the data. We actually have context as a service. We talked about the rise of the robots, all things robots. Like imagine having a life-size robot that can take over activities that, that maybe it's too difficult for you to do. Like, like my mother, she's in her early 80s. It's hard for her to change the sheets on her bed. And that's one of the things I do on the weekend, right? To, to maybe help remember, she can have Alexa now. They can help remind her 
about her appointments or set the alarm clock, but we have the technology today with the information and imagine what we're going to have in the next third, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. All right. So this is, I've said this many times and others say it. Almost anything that can be used for bad, I mean, for good, can also be used for bad. So let's talk about what it looks like maybe from the, the threat landscape, All right? We talked about quantum computing. Um, and uh, does that mean that all encryption will be breakable? I mean, I don't know what we can say what that means. In my history in the tech industry, 40 years or 30 years in security, how many of those algorithms are now, you know, used to be like DES, like, woohoo, that's the thing to use. No, don't use DES anymore. We can break that. Okay, we have DES 3. Nope, don't use that anymore. Three. We have RC4. No, don't use that anymore, right? When the power of the computers can do that. Now, think about what what Justin said, which is true. All those, all the, everything that's been encrypted from years past, quantum computing enabled to now decrypt some of that or technologies, for example, that are able to gather information and knowledge from the encrypted text. Like for example, Cisco has a, a one of its, uh, its extended network analytics that is able to pull useful information out of encrypted network traffic in order to determine if it's malware, we are gonna see some of that technology. Adversarial AI is gonna be protect uh, is gonna be perfected. And I, I would imagine probably in the next couple of years, right? This is actually using AI against us. It's making small tweaking changes in the algorithms that are un, undetectable. I mean, think about, and these could be like years of low and slow attacks or under the radar. Think about the whole solar winds thing and some of the thing that um, Ed Scotus talked about on day one. I mean, there are threat actors out there who aren't going to have an issue with 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 like waiting in the wings, with like doing that research. Like think about think about like the Darth Vader of James line. Now that would be pretty scary, right? There, there are threat actors on that whole side that are just as smart and together like super, super brain power that may be doing these sort of things. Data is gonna be pervasive. It is pervasive today. And, and I, really, I'm, I, I mean, one of my areas is privacy. I've done a, I've done a lot of privacy, but you just be surprised. You go out and try to find, uh, find, you know, even like, in California, PG&E is one of our energy companies. The amount of data that they collect that they don't need is surprisingly like, wow. Um, and even within Cisco, this is funny. I was doing a talk at Cisco on data pervasiveness. And I said, well, what is the oldest thing I can find out about Michelle at Cisco? And I actually found a picture that was from my new hire period. So we're talking 25 years ago. Uh, and I actually remember the shirt I wore. I remember where the picture was taken and it was still there. But um, it, it's just going to be, it's there. I, 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 I was doing a Google and trying to see like what's the oldest um, file out there I could find where I was doing something. And I, and I was involved in the initial drafting and publication of RSC 1244, which was the incident response way back in the 90s. I actually found an email uh, that was published on the stream. Like it was a whole email text where we were talking about changes we needed to make to RSC uh, 1244. Now look at 5G. I mean, 5G is just, it's in the rollout phase. It's gonna be a couple more years before it's pervasive, but that is gonna bring us ubiquitous network access. And now we're gonna see, you know, my surgeon can be in Saudi Arabia and he's gonna be doing robotic surgery from there. Now, I'm not sure if I would be like totally cool with that, but you know what? In places where they don't have medical expertise in the locality, being able to bring that expertise within, within 5G connectivity is gonna, is gonna do a lot for the world. There are tremendous security concerns with 5G, right? Because from the end-to-end -end network, you have multi-vendor, multi-countries, and that's where you see some of the stuff where people are saying, well, I'm not gonna use Huawei because I don't know what countries it goes through. I'm not using this technology or I'm not using that technology. 6G is on the horizon, but that's at least 10, you know, 10 years off. We already talked about additive manufacturing, right? Think about what they could print to be harmful or small tweaks that they could do to be harmful or actually um, dirtying the actual printing 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 materials. And we talked about automated 
uh, transportation. So those are going to be the threat threat themes. So how do our defenses need to evolve? I mean, you are the cyber professionals of the future. Now, some of you may be in the industry now. Maybe you're interns, or or maybe you're in the you're in the you're in your first job in the cybersecurity industry. Maybe some of you are going to be there in four years. We have future CISOs and future CSOs here. How must our defenses evolve? Joanna said, you know what? When you become a CISO, your job is going to be much different than mine because you're going to be looking at all those technologies. It's going to be mind-blowing, exploding of like, how do I secure the end-to-end infrastructure, right? In my role, one of the, in, in, at Cisco, what I did at NASA Ames Security Center, um, NASA Ames Research Center long ago in a galaxy far away, um, I established the first security program there. And when I came to Cisco, I was actually the first full-time security person they hired to start, how do we actually secure the Cisco network? So most of my career has been building the security infrastructure, not on the uh, on the offensive side, but how do we actually secure every aspect of the network, every application? And so those defenses must evolve as we evolve our technologies and move forward. And we're not gonna wait. We don't wanna wait till 2030 and say, well, well, how do we do that now? We need to be thinking about that now. What are gonna be the programming la- languages? What, are, what is gonna be the application infrastructure? Are we actually ever gonna truly achieve multi-cloud um, platforms? So we're not just Amazon specific or Google specific or Azure, right? How are we gonna to go to global regions? This is where y'all come in. You are our professionals of the future and we need lots more. So after this conference, you are our evangelists. Go out, go forth and invite other people into the, the competition. All right. Hopefully y'all are enjoying this. And if you can't tell, I'm from Texas. I still have the y'all, I'm sorry. It's probably not professional to say all the time. This is part of who I am, right? Go Texas A&M. All right, so a a standard that we use, that we've used in the security industry for as long as I can remember, it used to not exist, is in meantime to detect, y'all, you all should know this because this is part of what you're in, and meantime to respond. Now, before we had lots of cool tools and I like, hey, the way I did uh, forensics in my day was regex expressions, okay? We didn't have none of those cool tools. We didn't have none of the debuggers. It was like, you use your coding skills to like sift through all that stuff. So I used to be able to do it pretty good. Not anymore, I'm quite rusty. But meantime to detect is like, how long before like take solar winds? Like we know like they were in doing that stuff months before they were found. So the mean time to detect on solar winds, like dudes, y'all totally blew it. We're talking like months, they were in there. So we want mean time to detect to shrink to, to not weeks or months, not days, not hours. We want minutes and that's where we need to get to. Mean time to respond, that's how that's y'all's skill set. How fast are you going to be able to find those incidents? How fast can you write out those codes? And and you know what? What's going to help us do it meantime to respond is those robotic assistants. We're going to talk about that. But we have to balance velocity, the velocity, the pace of business with the re- reliability of the business infrastructure and what we do. Right. And so some of the things that we're going to need. Yeah, it needs to be simple. Like I've been in the industry and um, nothing is plug and play. Some things like you go get your Wemo and then they probably don't even make Wemos anymore. But when I was doing IoT, fabulous, right? Go get you some IoT devices, get a network sniffer on your own network, no one else's, and just check out, you know, (laughs) look what they're doing. (laughs) Those are like plug and play. Those are easy. But in, in in the real world, much of the technology that runs our infrastructure is not plug and play. It's left up to the, the, the customers who are buying this stuff to actually install it security and do all the stuff. So you say like, why is there a password? Cisco 123. Well, they didn't read the instructions that says change the default password, right? So in the future, we have to have simplicity in design and function, right? It has to be intuitive to install and uninstall. It's gotta be secure by default right? It has to be privacy by design. Hey, I'm hoping some of you 3,000 finalists want to be privacy professionals in the future. You may think privacy is boring, but let me tell you, this is an area that's ripe 
for innovation. It's an area that's ripe for startup companies. Hey, if you like crypto, if you like solving very difficult problems, privacy is an area for you to get into. Global data sovereignty challenge, market access challenge, certification challenge, how do we do it? So privacy by design. Serve as everything needs to be as a service with no lock-in. Customers aren't buying all this on-prem. I mean, they are in some percent, but it's not about just buying. We're not gonna rack and stack hardware. They want as a service. I want it in the cloud. I wanna be able to sign up for easy. And I wanna be able to say, sorry, you're not doing a good job. So I'm going over here to this vendor. And it's and we want it to be persona based, right? I don't I want to have some default personas that I can install this on because everything's about dashboards and automated reports. And, and as a Ron, if I'm the CIO like Ron, there's certain information that I need to look at. And there's a different set of information if I'm Joanna, if I'm the CISO that I want to look at. And there's a different information if I'm Vishnu, and I hope I said it right, if I'm like the uber, super duper DevOps engineer, there's different stuff that I want to be able to look at. And so we, we want to have all this simplicity by design and APIs by uh, integration. All right, go down. All right. Another huge area we need is end-to-end -end supply chain integrity. This, people may think, well, the supply chain is kind of boring. Well, how boring did you think it was when you couldn't, your parents couldn't get gas to go on vacation last month, right? When, when the colonial pipeline was down, the pipeline was broken, what happened? Or solar winds, right? Or the meat packing company, all of a sudden meat, like my ribeye steaks went from $21.99 to $35.99 overnight because there was a supply chain issue, right? What, what happened last weekend? with all those ransomware attacks, there was one supermarket chain that had to close over, I think 400 stores. That just, hmm. And when you think about additive uh, manufacturing, AKA 3D printing, supply chain challenge, right? There's things that we need to ensure end-to-end -end integrity. And there is a lot of security that goes into this whole end-to-end -end supply chain. We have not seen the end of the supply chain being compromised within US infrastructure to date, let me tell you. It's hard to tell how much uh, they are in. All right, now someone asked a great question on day one to Ed Scotus. Actually, it was Justin, the bow tie guy. I remember I saw it in the in the post. Um, one of the challenge organization has is this like the basic visibility. What is on my network? Why is that so hard? Well, when you have a really large organization like Cisco or GE or you name some other whatever big organizations out there, it's really hard to know. One reason is because you have engineers that are buying equipment on their company credit cards, and you know they're you know they're they're running they're running a lab under their desk on some infrastructure. They're buying Raspberry Pis, right? And then you have people bringing their IoT devices to work. Visibility is a challenge, but that's just the base. We have to, we must, and we're seeing this progression right now where tools are moving us from visibility to observability, right? So visibility is about knowing what do I have? Like how many Linux boxes do I have? Or you know, how many applications do I have it or, or running um, um, Apache struts? Or how many, how many applications are running this particular Lambda? Or how many applications are running this particular API? Or how many boxes do I have that are running this, whatever it is, version? Um, you have to have that visibility. Monitoring is about like, what in the hell just happened? The pipeline is down, right? When they, when they were talking about the colonial, when the, when the person shut down the colonial pipeline, the CIO, like we're talking like Ron, the Ron guy, at Colonial Pipeline, it was like the first time in the entire history of the Colonial Pipeline, they shut it down. He sees the message from the ransomware dudes or gals or whoever, thought to be Russians, we don't know for sure. Like you have X amount of time to give us this X amount of money, it was probably millions of dollars. And he thought, OMG, we must shut it down. He, he didn't know what happened. Uh, he, you know, he had to go back and find out observability where we're going and you hear companies talk about we need full stack observability. Observability is about what is happening right now or any time or why or regardless of what solution It's like that 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 3D visibility into what's happening on every level of the network. And I'll give you a simple um, example here. 
And I always use, I like to use uh, oxygen levels. My husband's had a lot of uh, health issues. And so this is from data point to observability. And, and actually oximeters became popular during the pandemic which is, you know, for me, that's been a common day thing we've had for like 15 years. An oximeter is a data point. You put it on your finger and in a few seconds, it reads your blood oxygen level, 96. It should be for all y'all, it should be 98, 99, 100. It gives your pulse here, it's 85. So this person was a little bit excited. That's a point in time. I have to put it on. I look at the data, I make a decision. Recently uh, in the last year, and I can't remember this device is something that you wear while you're sleeping. Sleep apnea is a real thing, right? You can't hack an oximeter. You can't hack an oximeter, right? Unless it's Bluetooth. This other device, I forget what it's called. It starts with an O, has Bluetooth connectivity because it's connected to your iPhone. It sleeps, it monitors your oxygen uh, level when it drops. Because if you have sleep apnea, your oxygen level will drop and it, and it has a hepatic um, functionality that will like wake you up and you'll, ah, all right, and you'll breathe again. Right, that's, that's more monitoring, right? Observability is our, our watches, right? I have, it's, it's constantly now with the Apple Watch 6 is reading my blood oxygen, not constantly, a certain number of times a day, reading my blood oxygen levels. And I can look up, I can look, um, uh, and I can set alerts, right? If my oxygen drops below whatever I want it to be, 89, it must, let me, so look, if it's below 89, your organs are struggling. It needs to be above that, right? And it can give me an alert, right? And so, um, and then I have a history. So that's telling me observability. Like if I'm, if I didn't wear my sleep apnea machine, I do have sleep apnea. If I don't wear my sleep apnea machine, I can look at my, my health data for the previous night and I can see where my oxygen dropped, right? And I can get an alert. So that's observability. You, you, this, this generation, when you come in, you want to be all about observability and what's going to help us get to observability is that automation, that automation with AI ML and robotic capability throughout our network. There's a lot to secure there, right? Okay. We've talked about uh, robots. We're seeing now the rise of all things chatbots. I'm sure. Well, okay. Maybe some of you might remember, they might've been five or something. How many people remember Clippy, the paper, the paper clip, right? Or, or you name it. Yeah, Clippy, right? So now what do we, so we have, um, uh, we have Alexa. We, I forget what the new thing is called. And I'm a Microsoft PC person. So y'all can laugh at that or not. Um, the chat bots are on the rise. They are helping us. The particular one I have here is from a, a startup company called security.ai. And it's a great it's a privacy product. So chatbots, as a as a as a cybersecurity specialist, as an incident responder, as a security operations engineer, as a threat hunter, they're going to help you do things that you need to do to get that mean time to detect shorter, and the mean time to respond shorter. Because that's the name of the game. How fast can we put in? Uh, into the fix, right? It's gonna help us, it can log into application. You know, the thing here it says, they're like, oh, hi, Michelle, based on your last five searches, I think you should actually do this regex expression to get the data that you want, right? It's making that interpretation. And we've done it through enough learning, right? We've given enough um, in the training, the model that it's, you know, at first it's 90% correct. And then we raise it to 95% more correct. And now it's 98% more correct. And so we're raising that level of what the chatbots can do today. And so I'm sure all of you experience chatbots at some point during the week. You go out and you're trying to do customer service. You get the little pop-up, hi, can we speak to you? And, and sometimes, maybe a lot of times now, those are actual people on the other end, but you are now going to organizations where that's fully automated, right? They're, they're gonna go look up for you. And we're gonna be able to do increasingly more things with chatbots with AI ML. Now think about that from a threat landscape, a threat actor perspective, right? We can um, do, well, all right, so the threat actor, think about solar winds, and I know maybe you haven't done all these, you know, deep dive on solar winds, but so they tweak the chatbot just like they used to do in the old malware, right? They would change, they would, you know, they would, they would hide the process or name it something else so you didn't see it. So they it tweaks the AI ML engine. This goes into adversarial AI. And so it's it's not even looking at the fake thing that the chatbot's doing. So you totally miss it. 
right? So the chat bot's giving the answer that's not correct. And when in reality, it's feeding you false data, right? All right, so this is cool. Somebody asked about this the first day. Um, and we had PJ from Palo Alto Networks on the first day, and she is an offensive security leader. Go out to YouTube. I think it was uh, Dreamforce she was on. They have this whole thing where they did red team, blue team lie. But you know what? There is going, I believe, it doesn't exist today. Maybe some of you are going to create this. There is going to be red team, blue teaming via augmented reality. Now think about James's masterclass presentation on day two, where you were watching him type. You saw James and he was doing his ultra cool. He was in that white t-shirt. He was looking like buff and all that sort of stuff. He's typing on the keyboard. But now we are virtual and some of you are on the red team and some of you are on the blue team and we have our heads up display and you're like in the mind of James. Right, so the application has all of James's knowledge. I don't know, it's not gonna be possible, but like, just let's just, just go with the flow for a little bit right here, right? You have all that knowledge. And so you're gonna see, like you're in the mind of the threat actor. And yeah, Neuralink, right? You're in the mind of the threat actor, but it's, it's hard to fathom, but you know what? It's gonna be based on known threats that took place and the known responses that we did. So we are gonna have the information to train these models. It's gonna happen, kids. I'm telling you, this is a possibility. And some of you on this call and some of the people that go through this program are the people that design this, because it's all about, you know, like there was no red teaming, blue teaming when I worked at NASA Ames in my twenties. We didn't have any, we had no tools. We had regex, we had DNS. Like it took a long time to find some of these stuff let me tell you i had to do it the hard way like i walked five miles in the snow to get the nasa ames and you know my first laptop was 300 baud shoot some of you probably have a t1 connection or you have the you have the starlink so you have fabulous download but this is going to happen right when when we get to the place where we have full stack of ability we have the maturation of the ai ml um algorithms we are going to enable the incident responders to shorten that mean time to detect, shorten that mean time to respond, so we can we can actually respond faster with what we need, and actually then build into the intelligence and the suggestions. Okay, now how do we actually change our security infrastructure so we don't have these things in the in the first place? All right, all right. How many of you heard of left shift? Anyone? No, all right. So in the industry, left shift is the thing. Because what happens today, well, not so much, but like in the olden days and, and still today, right, is develop, develop. We got all this cool stuff. People are like developing, develop, we push out, and security is in version two, right? They don't have all the cool, they're not doing all the stuff. So left shift, I'm out of the camera, but left shift means you start putting more control into the development teams, right? See, now you see my hand. More control into the development teams when you think about DevSecOps and all the stuff. And so they're actually less shifting to whereas they're developing the code, as they're actually thinking about what library routines I need and what APIs I need and even what testing I need. And now AIML is gonna help us as where is that you're shifting all the building. How do I actually build it securely to the very beginning, right? There's a whole other area that, that you haven't been um, exposed to yet. That's about threat modeling. This is where you're thinking about like, I'm gonna think how a threat actor thing. I mean, if you're doing threat hunting, you're like James, like you're trying to figure out how I can smash the stack on that particular program. But if you're a threat actor thinking like, how do I actually, um, um, if I'm gonna build something, you're thinking about like, how are the threat actors gonna compromise that which I'm building? And because you have the expertise, right? In, in my, so having been in the industry 30, 30 plus years or whatever, um, and I go in and I, I do consults with people who are like presenting how they're gonna do something. My mind is an explosion of the whole threat landscape. Like I'm thinking like, uh, okay, like how am I gonna like get around this or get over it or how I'm gonna break into it. So now we're putting that knowledge and the left shift is to put those tools earlier in the development life cycle. So there's this whole rising area much needed. I mean, we had, we had the whole, think about, well, 
this is way before y'all, but um, you know, it used to be like companies would do a release like once a quarter or once a year, right? And then maybe they're doing a release once, once, once a month, and then maybe once a day. Now, like if you and, and Netflix was one of the first companies that now they're like doing multiple releases per hour. And so we went from operation, like how do we build, test, deploy? And now it's like all in the all in the CI CD pipeline, right? And it's building those those tools in. So when we have automation, then we're we're actually doing all the necessary necessary things we need to do up at the front, so we have secure code. So this is a so it's called DevSecOps. Like there's a whole you're actually combining the security team with the with the software development teams. For those of you who are like you love to code, like coding's your thing. And hey, I coded in the early days. I learned to program in um, um, way long ago. Like we're talking like 1980, okay, Stone Ages. Actually, fun fact, funny fact, I learned to pro, my first programming language was Fortran on punch cards. Okay, we're talking a long time ago. Uh, and But I discovered, you know what? I discovered I had a talent for programming. I don't know Python yet, but hey, I'm sure I could probably learn it in a day if I tried. All right, so left shift is doing all this great then. So think about the left shift is also termed the paved road, right? If you're gonna go on a journey, if you're gonna go on a hike and you have this big long dirt road with rocks and boulders and little bunny hills and all that sort of stuff, and you see this freshly paved highway that's smooth and you have one of those cool new scooters, um, which road do you want to go down? You want to go down the paved road. Why? Because it's going to be faster. So the whole idea of less shift is you're speeding up the development life cycle. You're doing it more securely. You're getting the product out because you know what? The consumers today want it fast. They wanted it yesterday. And so we need to think about how do we create the ultimate paved road? There is a lot of security functionality that's needed from that perspective. All right. Last, can you believe I'm actually gonna finish the talk on time and have time for questions? This is so not Michelle. I'll also tell you that I handed in my presentation last Friday. And for those that know me, they were probably like laughing because I am like hot off the press, under the wire kind of presenter, but you know, I actually done this presentation. So the last thing that um, is just like emerging is accelerated learning. Like there's so much knowledge. I mean, what you, are learning in high school and college today is so much bigger than what I learned when I started college in 1980. I did go back to college and got my master's in 2014, 2016, and I learned a lot more. But now it's, we need to like, how do we do accelerated learning? And you know how they're doing some of that? AIML. So I don't have to read the whole 350 pages. I don't have to listen. You won't have to listen to this whole talk. There, there are uh, innovations about how do they pull out the pertinent key facts that you want to know. Like, so it's a, it's a two and a half hour seminar and you just want to hear about James and smashing the stack or whatever. It will pull out those pertinent facts. Maybe accelerated learning is going to involve those cognitive implants that we talked about on the first page. Now think about from a threat actor perspective, how might you do something to impair uh, or to put in some negative or bad actor types of things in our whole accelerated path, right? We need accelerated learning, right? You're, you're, um, it does not mean like you're learning less, you're learning the same amount, the key amount that you need to learn in a shorter period of time. Now you're all within this foundations program that I think you have access for four months. Uh, it's ending in September. I told James, like James, I need to like rub off some of the rust. Uh, I'd like to have access to just to like brush up on some of my skills. So I might be doing it soon. So that's what we need. All right, guess what? We are to Q and A um, and coming to the end of our day. I hope, I hope some of you have uh, been able to hang out with me this whole time. We are gonna go to the Q and A box. Now, when it would have been really bad if I was like, I'm sure somebody would have said if I wasn't actually sharing my slides, but you know what happens at, at Cisco, we call it WebEx Bingo. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Can you see my presentation? Is it showing? Yeah, it happens even for us adults out there. All right, let's see the questions. <sighs> breathe. People often tell me that I, I don't breathe when I talk. And this is funny. Um, 
since we do have a few minutes here, funny fact, because I just remember this. Uh, I used to teach actually before SANS had all the certification courses, they had conferences for seven years. And I ran, I was like the, the MC and I helped design the program and I spoke at many of them. I had some of the first classes that we taught at SANS. And one of my comments from the attendees was, I wish they would nail her shoes to the stage because she like I get really animated when I talk. So I'm sorry, that's just me. So let's go to questions. Oh, I like Caitlin. This is terrifying. <laughs> I don't want to live in a world where we can't even look at each other as it other as we are looking at the screen. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of technology that's going to happen in the future. We have to be prepared for it. You are the generation that's going to help us secure it. Um, and I like being in person, but I also like that we can do things virtually, right? So executives don't have to travel all day to go to a one hour meeting. I can actually have an impact to people in another country. I can reach out um, on that. But what we want is, is we move into this new world where technology may look like it's uh, frightening. We're in the driver's seat to be able to secure, to secure that uh, technology. Um, on the PJ red team, blue teaming. Well, here's how I, I found it by accident. So I only met PJ a couple of weeks ago. We were on a panel on another cybersecurity talk and I just loved her participation on that panel. And so I went and I Googled her. I don't have her last name handy. I, I'm not even sure if I could pronounce her first name. <laughs> she goes, people just call me PJ. So you can look on the thing and look her up. It'll come up. It was, it was fun because there's two people on the stage because it was the ops team and her as a part of the defensive team. So they were walking through this whole thing about red teaming and blue teaming. And when I saw that, and, and actually what happened was we had a speaker that had a dropout because they had a death in the family. And I wanted to have somebody from the offensive side. And I had just spoken with her on a panel and she was awesome uh, on there. Okay, next question. Yay, somebody asked about privacy. Hey, there's privacy is a very difficult problem to solve, like um, almost insurmountable. And so if you think it might be for you, there's a lot of technologies that needed here. There's a lot of rules and regulations, there's certifications, but the place to go to start looking for information is IAPP, the Internet Association for Privacy Professionals. Hopefully I said it that way, but IAPP is, is the gold standard uh, for privacy certifi certification. You could look up privacy engineering Actually, privacy goes back before there was GDPR, which is like the megalodon of shark bites. There was the, the little alligator bites was the European uh, Union data protection and uh, it had little alligator bites, but GDPR is more like a megalodon. So those are two places. Love it. Hey, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and I can help you a bit more. All right, what do we got? Okay, why not Mac OS? So the real reason I don't have Mac OS is because I didn't want to do IT support for my household, honestly. I mean, it's just BSD or maybe it's now Linux. I don't know. Somebody asked that question. But um, and so I did that like I used to do like in the olden days, you had to do everything by hand. So I knew Unix and all the variants so well because that's what I did. I was a Unix system administrator. I was a programmer. And even the Cray supercomputer, hey, it ran BSD. Um, and so I just didn't want to do IT support. So that's really the real reason. And like, I'm sort of an older gal and um, I'm just sort of used, to, well, I'm used to the PC, but you know what? I can't do those flat, I can't do the flat um, type of keyboards and I can't make the Mac mouse pad work for the life of me. So those are the real reason. Hey, the technology's cool. I've done development on it. Um, and I like that. It's got a great display. My husband likes Mac. All right. What's the hard, I like this one, Isaiah, the prophet. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. What's the hardest thing for me to do? <sighs> Not enough hours in the day. Um, I'm passionate about, uh, technology. There's been a lot of ups and downs in my careers. Uh, and the advice, like I'm persistent uh, and I love to learn, right? And the way I learn is if I want to present on something and just for the program committee team who's watching the clock, I'm watching it too, is like, for example, uh, when the Apple watches were coming out, you can see I have one's the Apple six, my second one. And everyone's like, oh, I'm going to get an Apple watch. And I'm like, wait, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that technology just yet. We even went to the Apple store was talking to the guy and I'm like, so, so what about the privacy on this? 
And I was asking questions like, I actually don't know. So then what I did is I research. If I don't know something, I research it. And we all need to be in that habit from a security perspective. And then I commit to do a talk on it. And so before I actually research it, so that makes me actually do the research and learn it. Um, and so really, the I, I don't know what the hardest thing, I actually, I'll be honest, Isaiah and everyone else on this call, and I shared this on day two, <laughs> I still am challenged with imposter syndrome. I don't know why. Yeah, I'll, 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 I see, I'll, I'll be wrapping up. So that's like in dealing with that. I'm literally one of five female distinguished engineers in a population of 30,000 engineers at Cisco. There's about 100 distinguished engineers, right? And so I, I am the, the gold standard. And so, yeah, so that's a good one. All right, what's the next one? Greatest challenge I face in my current role, not enough time. Like I'm responsible for emerging incubation and security. And actually the greatest challenge is my primary responsibilities around data sovereignty, market access, global privacy. And so it's a hard area. And what I'm doing right now is looking at opportunities for innovation. And I'm about to start a small team where we're gonna think about some patents that we can submit on technology and bake out some ideas. So that's super, super uh, exciting. Uh, tech's not gonna go backwards. It's just not gonna happen, right? It, we're gonna keep expanding, it's not gonna happen. Um, all right, we'll scroll down here and we're gonna wrap. So actually I'm gonna, I wanna be on, there's some other questions. Hey, if someone's like got some burning questions, I really wanna know this about Michelle, you know, you, my Twitter was out there. You connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm passionate about developing the next um, generation. I've been passionate about that. And it's about connections, right? You've made connections at this conference. You Let me tell you, those are important. What Justin said, is, those are important. I shared earlier, back in 1990, a person named Matt Bishop, super uber smart, um, tenured professor, sent Alan an email and Alan Powell and said, you need to meet Michelle. She's a smart kid. And Alan gave me opportunities and I grabbed those opportunities. 30 years later, we're still doing stuff together. So connections are important. So listen, all you folks that are out there working on your foundational material, finish it. Even like I had some people yesterday saying, it's so, it's so hard, should I, should I continue? Yes. Think about what Rob Lee said on the first day. It's gonna be hard. Don't quit because it's hard. Now, if you're like, man, I don't know if this security stuff is really for me, reach out to one of us and have a conversation with us, but finish. You guys have this tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Sign up for the next one. We're starting the next, um, and I don't know when the date is, but look for it. The next CyberStart competition, I think is gonna start in the fall. This is gonna be the second one. You can still get, Design, yeah, October 5th, thank you. You can still get designation. Invite your friends, you know what? Because people don't know if they actually have the cyber skills. Just like in 1980, I didn't know I had programming skills. I got into, I got into computer science because my karate instructor at the time, fun fact, I'm a retired 4 p black belt in Kempo, said, hey, you need to take computer sciences. So you never know, maybe your sister, maybe your other people in your classmates, get them, get them to sign up. And lastly, there is going to be a conference um, uh, questionnaire or survey. I forget what you call it. We want to hear feedback, right? When I was deciding, uh, when we were working on the program, I was trying to finalize, we came to the table with a lot of ideas. And initially, we were going to make it eight days. And we thought, you know what, these kids is going to get too tired in eight days. We had all these topics. And then so we had to think about, like, what are going to be the topics that are going to make the biggest impact to this group? And I hope, I hope we hit a home run there. Like we had some great talks. I know they weren't all technical, but this was just as much as about polishing what's gonna make you successful in the industry. And that was our goal. We had a lot of tremendous speakers. Uh, I've loved watching the chat stream. I, I so know that some of you are gonna be these awesome professionals in the future. And someday I hope to meet some of you in person.